What's up guys, Tim Little, Matt Allen. Welcome back to Tactical Bassin. Today we are going in depth, everything you need to know about flipping and punching. We're covering it all. Big baits, drop shots, some other techniques you might not have tried out. You're gonna to wanna to check this out. These summer videos that we've been doing would not be complete if we didn't do an in-depth flipping and pitching video. We've done them in the past, but it's time for an update. This is the first video Tim and I have got to sit down together in what, like awesome. six months. Uh, we have been traveling separately all over the place. We've come together and done some fishing, but we hadn't had the opportunity to just sit down and talk with you guys. So today we're putting our heads together. We're bringing you everything. We're bringing you the stuff you're expecting, how to rig, how to flip, how to punch, but we're going to bring you some things that you don't expect as well. I'm gonna kick it off with one of those things. So there's a few different ways to rig for punching, but this is one that I've really not seen talked about. And it is something that I did for years and years and years and years without talking about it. When the going got tough, but the fish were still in the cover, I went in there and started drop shotting for them. We're gonna circle around and get really in depth with all of these different rigs here in a second. To kick it off though, why don't you talk about what this is to start with? Why are the fish in here? What is flipping and punching? Let's get a quick rundown there and then we're going to go really in depth. Okay, absolutely, summertime, it's hot out. You get that real thick grass, you get those mats, you get the real thick grass lines on the tule lines. Those fish like to get up into that real thick cover. It's cooler, it's where the bait fish tend to hang out. It's easy ambush points. You get on those little tule points, those grass points back up in there, ambush points. It's, it's, it's more comfortable for the bass to be up underneath that cover. So you have to be able to go in through and get them out. So punching, heavy flipping, that rig that he was just talking about, that, that power shot, that drop shot through that stuff, that canopy, if you will, that's where those bass are gonna be. Starting off, yeah. a punch rig. Most of you guys have heard about a punch rig. What this is, this is a Texas rig style bait. You got an ounce to an ounce and a half tungsten sinker to some kind of a creature bait to a heavy, um, what do you want to call it? Like a, a super line hook, if super you will. Super line hook, flipping style hook. Yeah, a flipping style hook. Something that's not going to bend when you're throwing 65 pound test or 80 pound, you know, braid through that stick, thick stuff to get those fish out. You need a real heavy setup. So you're going with a straight braid, typically 65 pound test. Some people use 80. You're going to use that real heavy tung, you know, tungsten weight. You want that tungsten weight to be able to penetrate like a like a missile through that stuff and get that bait crashing down through there because it still is a reaction bite. And then you follow that up with your favorite with your favorite creature bait. And we're going to talk about all of this stuff uh, in depth. Uh, circling back around to what you just said, the the whole game here. You know what Texas rigging is, right? Everybody throws a Texas rigged Senko or a Texas rigged creature bait or anything else. But the whole concept here is we all like frogging and throwing top water and calling fish up out of the grass, getting them to chase down a lipless crankbait in the spring. But when it gets so thick that you can't do that anymore, this takes over. It's still those same fish, but they're in a place that you could never reach any other way. If they're not willing to come up through it for a frog, you have nothing left except to punch. So circling back to this drop shot, I'm gonna run all the way through this setup. The idea is very simple. It is a drop shot. So you've got a hook suspended up above a weight and that's it. That's all there is to it. But you punch through and you're able to go with a little lighter weight because as the weight goes through, it will build up speed before the worm gets there and it'll suck the worm right through the hole. So I can usually get away with a quarter to a half ounce lighter on the drop shot setup than I will on the creature bait. So if I'm flipping an ounce and a half on the creature, I'll flip an ounce on the drop shot and you can come down from there. You wanna go as light on your weight as you possibly can when you're flipping and punching because that weight is up there banging around, pulling that hook out of that fish. If you're flipping with a two ounce weight, you're going to lose a lot of those fish. Now you do it because the fish are in there so thick you have to. But if you don't have to, if you can get in there with an ounce or three quarter, get in there with lighter weight, you'll land more of your fish. So back to the drop shot. 
what this essentially is, is just a tie-on drop shot weight. Here's a, here's a standard version. That's like a three eighths or a half ounce tungsten. And you just tie it on instead of clip it on. Well, they come in giant varieties too. This one was the first one on the market. This one's long since been discontinued, but there's some brand new options made of tungsten instead of lead that are so much better than this. We're gonna link all that for you in the video description so you know exactly what to do. But like Tim said, 65 pound braid, I'm using a three aught super line hook, not a giant hook and not a giant worm, but it's super line, so it's strong. Then about an eight inch drop, and then I tie on that weight. And again, when you flip, that weight's gonna punch through, suck that worm through, get to the bottom, shake it, let it sit. Shake it, let it sit. Shake it, no bite, pull out, try again. It's just a finessier approach, a more natural, easier form to eat, not such a big package approach to punching. For the worms themselves, I'll circle back to the specific worms. I've got three of them, but the baits themselves are all smaller, six to seven inch worms with shorter ribbon tails. I like the ribbon tail because it's moving so fast when it comes in, you get a good swim. But you know how some worms have big, long ribbon tails? You're not going to find me using those because they get caught up in all the junk on the way in and the way out, and it's a mess. So shorter ribbon tails are best for this approach. That is the drop shot setup. If you haven't done it, which you probably haven't, because most people are not power shotting or bubba shotting, whatever you wanna call it, through that heavy cover, you need to try it. Now, the only other variation is the Tokyo rig. This guy has had all sorts of popularity in the past year. You tie on up here, there's your hook, and then you've got this straight wire dropper. The concept, now you're not gonna have that eight inch lead, but if you just want an easy way to go, it's easily adjustable, it's consistent, you can punch right through there. Take that Tokyo rig, oh, thank you. Take your tungsten weight that you would normally be Texas rigging with, put it on backwards so it's face down, and then all you do is take a pair of pliers and bend the end of it up so that that weight is stuck on there. And now you've got essentially the same setup as that drop shot rig, just a more compact package. And that will work extremely well too. Yeah, the benefit of the drop shot rig is the fact that it's a drop shot rig. It's suspending that bait up in the fish face, right? You know, that the Texas rig, the punch rig, when you come through, that's going all the way to bottom. On that setup, the weight's going to bottom and it's suspending that bait right in their face. Totally different look. Definitely a different look. And there's days when it's it works a lot better than than this guy right here so getting back to the punch rig i kind of flew through it a little bit now i'm gonna go a little bit more in depth on the style of uh, bobber stops the style of hooks because if you guys have been following us for a while you know that matt and i use different tackle for this mm -hmm. so going through this rig again 65 to 80 pound braid typically 65. there are a bunch of different bobber stops punch stops on the market uh, we like to use a few different ones. These guys right here, this is a six cents, really good. Sometimes if I'm throwing a ounce and a half or ounce and three quarter, a real heavy weight, I'll rig two up here just to keep that weight from thing. sliding up. You know, when you're going through that real heavy cover, you want this thing as, as, as streamlined. streamlined as possible to get through. So you hold that real heavy weight with the two bobber stops. Now let's talk about the hooks. This right here, this is actually Matt's rig right there. What hook is that for you? That's that jungle hook? That's the owner jungle four rod. Four rod. And I like to use a straight shank hook. You can see these hooks right here. Hopefully you guys can see these. You want me to hold one for you? Yeah, hold one up to the camera. See, it's just a straight shank versus this has the little 90 degree, the little bend in it. That's an EWG style, again, straight shank. Now the difference, when this is rigged in the worm, I'll show you. When this is rigged in the worm, it sets back into itself, but has a different hook angle than a straight shank. So if you look at that, the hook of the, the tip, uh, the, the hook tip is parallel to that bait right there. Mm, it's laying flush. Lays flush. Now, when you rig a straight shank, you want a bait? I'm gonna grab a different bait, yeah. 
Here's the beaver. When you rag, when you rig a straight shank hook, now that that hook point is pointing at like a 45 degree angle back up. See the difference? Now, there's not a right and a wrong way. I think there is. And I, I think so too. <laughs> but we both have success in both styles. Yeah. This is the stand. What Tim is doing is, is considered the norm. That straight shank hook, tons of power. When you hit them hard, you can show them how it, well, you don't have one I don't, rig. I don't have one rig. It'll but hinge. Yeah. Well, typically, when you're rigging these, you're tying a snell knot. And what that does, it kicks the bait at a 90 degree angle out so you get that real good hook penetration through the roof of the mouth. So when it's hanging below the weight, it's hanging like this, or it's actually on the bottom like this, right? When you set the hook with a snell knot on a straight shank, it'll cause this to kick out like that and stick them in the roof of the mouth. Right in the roof That's of the mouth. That's the theory, and it does work. Uh, the, e the reason that I choose to go the other way, the, the other way more than anything, two things. I feel like I have a better hookup to land ratio. That might just be my fishing style. There are great fishermen that do both. The biggest thing for me is my baits last longer because I'm not constantly punching through. I get it in there, I get it rigged, and then it stays. That's what I like about it. And you also think, well, we've talked about this a bunch, you think that once you get that hook penetration through with that little 90 degree hook, it holds the fish I think better. I lose a lot less fish. He thinks he loses a lot fish, a lot less fish because of that hook angle and the way that it, it turns inside the fish's mouth. Um, again, not, not a right or a wrong, but that is two different ways that you can rig a punch setup. Now, some guys will actually throw on a punch skirt. You know, there's different fisheries that um, the fish like that bigger presentation. So what you do, you run your bobber stop on first. So bobber stop on the line. Then your weight. Then your weight. And then you thread this thing on right there. Then your punch skirt. Then your hook and bait. And it essentially turns you into a jig. Right. You got you got that secondary action of a skirt. You know, when you're down there hopping it, that skirt's fluffing up. You're, you just got a lot bigger profile than uh, without the the punch setup. Now fishing them, you know, there's probably different ways to fish a punch setup, but my my favorite way to do it is is flip in there, let it fall on slack line, and you're gonna really want to get you to know your setup. You want to know the the weight of your entire setup because a lot of times you're not gonna feel these fish bite. As this comes crashing through the mat, they're just gonna react and eat it. So when you when this comes through the mat and you lift up on your rod and there's nothing there, reel down and sip wing because they ate it on the fall. But if they don't eat on the fall, flip it in there, let it fall, hit the bottom, check your rod, make sure it's not heavy or light, shake, 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 do it all over again, next spot. And you move very quickly because this thing comes crashing through the stuff. They're either gonna be on it or they're not. Yeah. I'm really glad you said something about it getting weightless because I wanna talk about, since we're on a little tangent here, the different ways that this bite can feel. Because the first time that you come out here, let's say especially to tulies or bull rushes or any of this stuff, you know, your big heavy grasses, and you go throw that thing back in there because sometimes the fish are right here on the front, sometimes they're back there, out of sight. And that rig will get those fish out of there. When they're in there, the first time you do it, you pitch in there and you're feeling a hundred different reads. And you're going, what's a bite gonna feel like? As I've traveled around, one of three things is going to happen. I can't tell you which is coming because it's completely different on every lake. I know exactly what it feels like on this lake. One of three things is coming. Be prepared for all of them, but I'm telling you right now, you will be second guessing yourself like crazy until one of the three things happens and then you will know. So you don't need to second guess yourself even though you're going to. First one, like he said, it's just gonna go slack on you. You're gonna pitch through, you're waiting for bottom and it's just not there. They just eat it and go and slack you out. You're in trouble, you better hit them hard. Second way, you're gonna flip in there, land and it's gonna go thunk. I mean, they massacre it. 
That is what will typically happen if you're on a fishery where other people aren't punching. Because these are unreached fish, they're untapped. Maybe guys are frogging, most guys aren't punching. Not deep in the cover. So they will eat it like a freight train. The third one, which is what we have here, you'll flip in, you hit bottom, you just shake it, you'll never feel a thing. But when you pick up, it's that telltale heavy mush. It would feel like nothing, except that if you're a jig fisherman, a worm fisherman, you know that mush. You know it from drop shotting where you pick up and that doesn't feel right. Throwing a shaky and all of a sudden there's something there. Same thing here. You'll get a feel for what an ounce or an ounce and a half feels like. And all of a sudden, it's not that. It doesn't feel like a clear bite, but it is very clearly different. And when it's different, swing for the fences. <laughs> Two things on that. Be careful when you swing for the fences, because <laughs> if it isn't a fish, now you got an ounce and a half bullet headed your way. That is so true. So make sure you're wearing you know, sunglasses and stuff. You don't want to lose an eye or anything like that. But I wanted to add a little bit on the bite if, if, that itself, because when you and I, when I first started doing this with you, it was very frustrating, because I would flip in there, shake, 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 nothing, and I'd feel a tonk, I'd reel down and swing, and here comes the, the bullet at me. And I missed so many fish. That tonk that I was feeling, was the fish spitting it, not eating it. So make sure you're on it. As soon as that falls through, you're checking it because if you feel right that away. tonk, you missed them. Yep, that's great. All right, third variety. This guy right here. Flipping and punching with a big jig. There are going to be two versions. You've got flipping jigs, and punching jigs. What's the difference? Somebody changed the name. That's the difference, right? They've got the same stinking hook in them, little bit different head shape, but essentially the jig that you want for this type of fishing is going to be a pointed head. It's going to help split the cover and then the bait can follow through and fall. Flipping with a jig is amazing. It's probably my favorite way to do it day in and day out because it has by far the highest hookup to land ratio. If you stick them and you keep pressure on them, most of them make it in the boat. When they've got that big tungsten out there in front of them and they're thrashing and it's flopping, it just rips itself out. That's what Tim's point was about two bobber stops. That keeps that tungsten from going up the line and just whipping. It at least keeps it in there tight like a jig. The other nice thing about a jig is that it has a weed guard. That's where the the weedlessness comes from. Well, that weed guard, when it's in a fish's mouth and it's compressed, is also putting back pressure against that hook. It's helping pin the hook in place and lock it. It's like a second barb. So it really helps your hook up to land ratio. Now, the two different jigs. The biggest difference is the flipping jig that I like to use, that's that no jack flipping jig, only comes up to a three quarter ounce. If you need heavier than that, you go to a punch jig. So you can get them all the way up to like an ounce and a half. Things you need to know about flipping with a jig. One, you have to go heavier on your weight because you do have a weed guard. It's a little bit bigger package to try and drop through a hole in the cover. So if I can get away, I told you with the drop shot, I can go lighter on weight. With the jig, it's the opposite. If you're flipping three quarter ounce tungsten Texas rig, I'm flipping a one ounce in my jig. If I'm flipping an ounce and a quarter in my Texas rig, I'm flipping an ounce and a half in my jig. Just takes a little bit more to get it through, but it works so well. You get that larger profile. It's as if you've already got the punch skirt and everything else, right? When you put a punch skirt on, you're essentially building what looks like a jig instead of just having a jig. The biggest advantage to the Texas rig is that it does get through easier, especially when the cover gets crazy thick. Like they don't make a two and a half ounce punching jig to get where a two ounce tungsten can go. So there are times where you are just playing in cover that is too thick for the jig. It's not going to work and you just forget about it. But if you can get a jig in there, it will catch them. You rig it up the same way, except that it's an exposed hook. So just standard jig trailer rigging. You just thread it on there 
and you rely on the weed guard for your weedless protection. But it works. Those are your three different, or four different, if you want to refer to the two different Texas rig Texas hooks. Rig. Four different ways to rig these things. Uh, you want to jump into baits? Start talking about some of those specifics, or where do you want to go from here? Yeah, let's talk about baits. You know, there's a lot of different creature style baits on the market, beaver style baits on the market. Uh, again, the whole point of this is to be streamlined as much as possible. Some baits that I really like flipping or punching with on the Texas rig. Dang, you got organized over here. <laughs> the Rage Bug. Four different appendages on here. Make sure you pull these apart, let you separate them before you rig it up. But that gives a lot more action on the fall. As this thing's falling, you got a lot of appendages, tentacles down there, arms flailing around. So you're just getting a little more commotion, a little more movement out of the bait as it's coming through. Same thing, another striking, the Rage. <clears throat> the rage craw little slimmer body profile but a lot bigger claws a lot more mm -hmm. a slower paddle uh, again it's just you got to play around with the fish on your fishery but i typically like a beaver style bait you know the new kinky beaver the spicy beaver something with a little action in the tentacles and of course the you know the tried and true the the sweet beaver but any of these beaver style baits, uh, rage style baits, they, they work. Do you have any specific fav uh, favorites you like? I do. Um, the jack so like the jack The standard beaver, just like Tim said, the biggest thing you need to find out on a given day, and it will typically apply more than a day. So like, so far this summer, I've done way better here on baits that kick on their way down than I have on a standard beaver, which is different than years, years past. I don't know why, in the past, I did way better on the standard beaver than I did on anything that would kick. So that's the biggest difference. Know that you've got some baits like a beaver that are going to be essentially dead action. They're all profile, right? It falls, it lands, it looks good, but it doesn't swim down there. It doesn't swim back out. So you've got that. Once you get into the baits that kick, then you've just got varieties of how hard they kick, overall profile, that sort of thing. So Tim already talked about a couple of my favorites, but just to add a couple more, this is hands down my number one flipping bait. That's a Jackal Archelon. This is the gill color, and it to me it looks nothing like a gill, but <laughs> man, they eat it up in here. What it is, is think like a tube. So it's got a solid head, but the rest of it's actually hollow inside. So when I Texas rig it, I actually leave my hook point inside the interior of the bait and it is unbelievably weedless. It's fantastic. I don't even understand how when I set the hook, that point gets out of there and gets them. It makes no logical sense to me, but it works. I have an amazing hookup ratio. So incredibly weedless with a great hookup ratio. That's hard to find. I get that nice action a lot like a beaver. That kind of dead action appearance on the bottom, except that these flat paddles do get a really good kick going in and going out. It's not exaggerated. It's not big like a rage craw, but they do have a kick. It's just a great balance. That's my day in and day out bait. Then the other one that I use, especially when I start getting some murkiness in the water, is the kinky beaver. This one, much like the standard beaver and much like the spicy beaver, <laughs> All three of those, good gracious. So standard, no action. Spicy beaver, ton of action. It kicks hard on the way in and out. The kinky beaver is somewhere in between. It kicks hard on the way in and out, but it's also just got more body. It's a bigger profile overall, and I do really well on that one. I mean, look at the color that I, that I grabbed, right? That's what I had in my grudge. Standard, natural, big, bold, obnoxious. I throw it when that water gets murky. Those are the colors I stock it in. I don't even have it in a natural <laughs> color. That's not what I'm fishing in. But this bait, one thing I want to point out, it is bigger, it's got appendages, but you'll notice that we have not picked up a single large creature style bait. No brush hog, no man bear pig, no lizards, no 10 inch curly tail worms. The reason why is that all those longer appendages get caught on everything. You want to drive yourself nuts. Throw a bait with long appendages and hit one of these and have it go 
and tie itself into a knot, you can't get back out of those tulies. It will drive you insane. So every single one of these baits is a bait that will slip in and out of cover really, really well without giving you any trouble. Yeah, streamlined and very small profile. You can change your bait depending on how much kick you want, but all this stuff that we covered, you know, everything from the, the braid, the reels and rods, we haven't talked about that yet. We we'll will. get there. Uh, the baits, the tungsten, we'll link all that stuff down below in the video description so you guys won't have to go and find it. The last one to talk about is back to the worms. There are so many different worms on the market. Over the years that I've been punching through the mats, punching in heavy cover, I've had three worms that just work consistently. First one, that smaller power bait worm. That, do we have one rigged is up? Is that the seven inch? Yeah. I've got one rigged here. Oh. But I'm gonna need that one too. Yeah, I got this one. So that's it right there. It's a great worm, power bait worm, stink. I don't know what is on them, they stink, but fish eat them. It's got a great action in the water. It's got a ton of movement on the way down with that curly tail. But again, it's not a big oversized curly tail. It comes in and out really well compared to some of those longer tails. We got that guy there, which is the smaller zoom dead ringer. Same deal. It's got a bigger size tail, but it's not long. It's not a big long tail that's gonna wrap up on everything. Slips in and out of cover extremely well. And then the last one is also a zoom. This is the U-tail. Very cheap bait, inexpensive. It's small, slips in and out of cover really well. I have flat caught them on this thing year after year after year. And it's the only thing I use it for. And I don't pull a U-tail worm out for anything else but it is so good in this exact situation. Those are the three worms. Of everything that's out there on the market, those are the three that I've got all the confidence in. And I throw all three of them in very natural colors. Watermelon, watermelon red, green pumpkin, black flake, all natural. Because if it is murky water, if it is dingy water, we're going to that big punch rig because they can find it and they eat it. The only time I go to the drop shot is when the other stuff is not working. When you're punching, you're trying to catch big fish. The drop shot, they naturally get a little bit smaller overall. I don't know why, but my fish always lose a pound or two. But the difference is I can catch them when I can't catch them the other way. When you need a bite, it will get you a bite. That's the difference. And one thing to add on, if you guys have noticed on all of these baits, the colors are pretty much similar. We're going with real natural colors, or real dark contrasty colors, black, blue, hematoma, June bug, something they can see in that dark, up under that dark mat or in that dingy water. Yep, get yourself one of each or two of each, but a, a bold standout color and a natural and you're golden. One more tip for you. I think Tim's about to start talking rods and reels, but here's a tip for you. If you wanna save yourself some money and you go out here to start flipping and your braid is faded like mine is here and you don't want to go buy yourself a whole brand new spool of braid just because it's faded sharpie get the fat sharpie the one with the flat tip yep and if you, you can take a razor and put a little slit in it but it'll, it'll help all the difference you get that braid right in between that tip of that pen and it colors your, your colors braid. that braid back to a dark color instead of that bright because you know when you get braid it's that dark green it looks fantastic you don't have to do anything to it but over time it will fade to a light green, almost a white. When you turn it back to a dark shade, it just works better and you can save yourself because your braid is still good after it turns white. It's not until it starts getting frayed and messed up that you need to change your spool, unless you're punching, you need that dark color. So, it, you know, obviously dark braid is not gonna stand out in there one bit, but if a big piece of white braid falls down in there, that will stand out. So let's talk rods and reels. We kind of covered, I covered br uh, braided line a little bit. Again, heavy braid, 50, 65, 80 pound test. Yep. But when you're trying to get four, five, six, 10 pounders out of this heavy cover, you need a rod with enough backbone to get that hook penetration into their mouth and get that fish out. I like a seven, six to an eight foot heavy or extra heavy rod because you are power fishing. You're throwing heavy weights big hooks and you're throwing it in the thickest of cover. You know, Matt and I, we've raved about it for years. 
that X Pride 711 extra heavy is hands down our favorite punching awesome. rod. And it's what not available until it, it's back ordered it's, at the moment. So we have a, a handful of some rods we're going to recommend. I know you really like that rod. I like this one. That's the Mega Bass. It's a bunker buster. Uh, it's a higher end rod. But we will recommend down in the video description, you know, at at any price point, my favorite rod personally is that X Pride 711 Extra Heavy. But that doesn't help when you can't get them. So from top dollar all the way down to inexpensive, we will recommend you in the video description a handful of really good flipping and punching rods at every price point. One of my favorite rods for the power shot technique, the drop shot technique, or the lighter jig technique is going to be the 7.6 Heavy X Pride. Those mm -hmm. are available. It's a lighter rod than the extra heavy, the 711. But if you're on the lighter side of the flipping and punching, Especially you can get a, you shot. can get away with the 7.6. One last thing to add on rods. Uh, actually, I have two things that I want to add to that. One is that we are talking about dedicated flipping and punching rods right now. This is a rod that that is the only thing you're going to use it for. That 7-Eleven Extra Heavy is, is awesome. But when this bite is over, you're going to stick it in the rod rack and forget about it until the next time you need that rod. Uh, there's not a lot of crossover. If you're a guy that doesn't do this a bunch and you just want to dabble with it, what you want to do is get a good frog rod. 7-3 to 7-4 Extra Heavy. And we'll link you two of those down in the video description because I have two that, that we like for this. Uh, either one of those is a rod that will work. It's not perfect, but it will. A 7.3 extra heavy will absolutely pull a fish out of there. I mean, you can torque on them. I would rather have a little more length, but not if you're not looking for that dedicated rod. It will do it. It will get them out. And then you can turn around with that rod. You can throw a frog on it. You can take it, throw a heavy jig on it. You can fish it in the winter time with a big jig. You could, I mean, if you needed to, I guess you could even throw a great big worm on it. Right. There's a lot that you can do with it and it's not dedicated. Uh, last thing I wanted to add was something. So you keep talking, my old brain's in trying to remember what it was. Yeah, so we talked about, the, you know, the heavy rods, the big tall rods, some, but they, like Matt said, they are rods that you're, they're dedicated, they're specifically for that technique. Uh, shorter rods you can get away with the 7374 extra heavy something you would frog with you could Carolina rig you can do whatever um, as far as reels you're gonna want something typically with a higher gear ratio because when you when you flip or you punch through that mat and you're trying to catch up to check your line you don't want a five to one or even a six to one yeah. you want something that's like a seven to one or even an eight to one the higher gear ratio reel you're giving a little bit on that that low end that torque you know, but you get a lot more line, uh, you can cover line a lot, pickup. line pickup, yeah. You can cover up a lot more line in a couple real twists, real turns with that higher gear ratio. So I'll typically go with a seven one or an eight to one gear ratio reel on those big those big rods. I agree with you. I like a seven to one and he nailed it. The, the biggest thing with punching that you don't think about is how much reeling you're going to do. Like in a normal day of fishing, you cast out and you slow work a bait back to the boat. But with this, it's like punch here, shake, 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 burn, 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 pitch, shake, 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 burn, burn, burn. There's a ton of reeling. Yeah. A seven to one or higher is absolutely the way to go. I did remember what I wanted to talk about. Last thing for you, this is safety. Tim already touched on these weights coming back like a bullet. And it is no joke. I have seen people hit. My last boat, I had three different people punch holes in my cowling. Guys that were on my back deck, that had one zinging and literally just punched a hole through my cowling into my motor. Uh, I've had two people hit on the head. It's a serious deal. I mean, an ounce and a half of tungsten will kill somebody if it hits you right. So here is a tip that will make all the difference. It's hard for me to do with our camera angle right now, but I'm just gonna explain through it. Essentially, if I throw out there and I get stuck, now if I'm swinging on a fish, that's different, but you get stuck in the junk all the time it gets caught up and you've got to pull it out the biggest mistake that i see people make is they lean back on that rod to try and get it out of there and they load that rod up when that thing pops free it's coming hot and that is when everybody gets hurt it's not when there's a fish on when there's a fish on it typically goes smooth it's when a guy's stuck in the junk 
and wrenching on it and it comes free that people get hurt. So the biggest tip I can give you is that when we are throwing these things, I fish it with a flat rod, meaning I throw it out there and I keep my rod pointed straight out. I don't load that rod up. I don't bow it up. I stay pointed and you'll see, you know, I'll snap that rod tip. I'm working my bait, but when it's time to reel out, I don't bow up. I point and reel right now. I'm stuck in junk. And if I just keep going, it still comes to me. And if it breaks loose, the braid doesn't have a lot of stretch. So there's not a lot of force there to come rocketing back. If it breaks loose, it'll just drop instead of unloading that rod and coming back at hundred miles an hour. You will appreciate that one <laughs> if you haven't done it, because I can go through days of punching and not have a single weight come flying back across my boat. It never happens because you just work it and reel it out. But if you try and load up and get those things to come free, it's a matter of time before somebody gets hit. And it really is a serious deal. So be careful punching. There's a lot of momentum there. Take your time, think it through. When a fish eats it, you let them have it. But the rest of the time, be careful. Anything you wanna add? Yeah, real quick. So when you do get hung up and you're straight, reel down and slowly just pull that bait and it'll it'll come off of the clump whatever you're on grass or the toolies you don't need to you don't need to do like that because then it will come flying at you just reel down and slowly pull and then also on the hook set if you do like a 45 degree hook set or a side hook set instead of a straight over the head hook set it'll keep the bait from coming at you yeah it'll miss you if it does come yeah that's a great point guys we hope this helps you this is a long video <laughs> but we wanted to really go in depth because this is a fun technique you can catch monster fish doing it. This technique has only been out in the public eye for 10 or 15 years. It's a relatively new technique. In the past, when we were younger, once those fish went back in that stuff, they were gone. You just wave goodbye and wait for them to come out in the fall. It took time for somebody to figure out how to go in there and get them. So on a lot of fisheries around the country, it's still brand new. Your fish have never seen it and they will respond so much better than you think they will to you going in there and getting them out. We hope you enjoyed it. If you did, hit the like button, subscribe to the channel. We try and do these instructional videos for you. We go in depth, we do three videos a week. We're here to teach and to help you become a better angler. We'll talk to you soon. See ya.